Welcome back to another episode of Rib Academy. We are here. We are back with another one. Got a special guest for y'all today. Just here to talk about some Dallas Mavericks uh, talks. Hope y'all had a good day. I just recorded an episode yesterday with the Six Man Show. I told y'all I've been pumping out this content. I'm trying to get this content out for you guys. But, um, you know, shout out to Joel Moran Show. Shout out to the Fantasy Reaction. Pick a side and Rib Academy. I love to do my shout outs to get them out the way. And, of course, shout out to, you know, my other... Six man show, nothing on the board, chill town, stuff like that. But let's get it started. Let's bring up our guest, one of the primary leaders of the Dallas Mavericks fan club, MFFL Nation, if I said it right. My brother in Christ, how you doing? Man, I'm good. I appreciate you having me on, bro. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm happy to have you on. So first of all, you got to explain what's up with the background, where you at, where you from. Like You got you to gotta start off with that introduction, man. Yeah, so for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Mason. I'm currently in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm at my college that I'm going back to for my master's. I'm at Lynn University, and I'm going to be the graduate assistant coach here as well. I just wrapped up a four-year career at, on the basketball team here, too. So it's been it's been a hectic college life, but we're back here for the Masters. We're in a coaching job, so different perspective on the court now. Yes, I love that. Different, definitely a different vibe than what we usually have. You know, I didn't, I never played no college sports, so you know, definitely a different type of experience in your end. Uh, yo, shoot, 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 shoot us your stat line. You can't just say you played four years. No, 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 no. We can't, we can't shoot stat line. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, man. Hey, looking at like. 12 career points. I don't, I, it, we could pull up the practice clips, though. Uh-huh. I love it, that. So It's different. So you playing in college. Walk us through, like, just quickly, like, what was the day in the life of just, like, you know, being a, a college athlete, starting practice? Like, what, what what's a day-to-day, a regular Monday, Tuesday? How do y'all go through your days? So Lynn was a little different than other uh, schools. Lynn's a D2. So what we did after COVID, they switched to block scheduling. So we would have one class a day for two and a half hours. So I'd like to get mine in the morning, get it done with. So I'd wake up about 7.30, class from 8 to 10.30. And then you're doing weights from 11 to 12.15. Go get your therapy until 12.45. Got to be on the court taped at 1. And then we're practicing until like 2.45. And then you have film for 30 minutes. And then the rest of the day is really just free time. A lot of us, we would go back to the gym at night, get on the gun. Um, but it was nice, man. It was definitely definitely different from high school. You know, coming in, I thought it was going to be a different kind of vibe. I thought I'd be really locked in on just basketball. But people don't realize really that it's really a student athlete. You got to you gotta get both done, especially when you're not at one of those uh, high major D1s where you get tutors every – everywhere next to you yeah no no those d1 they make sure you will get the resources that you need i like that though so you and you're now you're going back and you want to be a coach for that team or just in general so right now we're just testing out that team we're going to see if we like the coaching side uh mm-hmm. before anything happens this is sort of just a stepping stone in it it's a graduate assistant role so really just learning from the coaching staff we brought on a new coach here that's been very successful at the juco level and our assistants returning as well so Looking forward to it, seeing if I'm going to love it or just like it, and we'll go from there. I'm excited. I'm excited for you. Congratulations, of course, Thank on you. that. So walk us through how did MFL Nation start? How did you get so many followers? How did you just, you know, become a Mavericks fan? How did you get with within the Mavericks community? So my friend back in Dallas, I'm in Florida now, but my friends back in Dallas, they were all on Twitter, you know, Twitter, Reddit, and they were all talking about the famous people on Mavs Twitter. I was like, Man, I love basketball. I grew up. It was my first sport. You know, I got to rep the Mavs, too. But, you know, I really became interested in the Twitter side of things. And when the Mavs were on their 2022 run, you know, we're not going to talk about the Warriors that year. But um, when they were on that run against the Jazz in the first round, I was like, you know, this might be the best time to try it out. And so I made the Twitter. Man, it was really quiet for the first six months. I think month six, I had like 500 followers. But I just stuck to the grind, man. I kept pumping out tweets, getting out the right content, reporting the right news, crediting people, which a lot of people don't talk about Twitter enough is credit really matters on there. And eventually it just kept growing. And I met the right people that were also using my content on Twitter and spreading it out. 
and now we're in year two of it. We're about to hit 21K followers, and it, it's been awesome. I love it. I love the connections I've made with people like yourself. I made connections with some of the Mavs players. Um, shout out Grant Williams when he was on the Mavs. He got me tickets to the Magic game. Oh, that for was, real? Yeah, he got me and my boy tickets to the Magic game. Um, got us post game passes. I got Luca's autograph. I flipped up with some of the guys. It was it was sick, man. I walked up to Derek Lively. I'm like, D Live. I'm I'm MFFL Nation. And if you go on his Twitter, he retweets all my stuff. And he's like, I be retweeting your shit all the time. And I was like, man, right. <laughs> appreciate that. So it's been it's been awesome, bro. So are you, are you taller than Grant Williams? Because I know he's about six seven. Six, I got eight. I got like half an inch on Grant. Ah man, that's that that definitely is funny. No, that's that's definitely exciting because I know we've had a couple encounters on Twitter. I forgot when was the first time I, I I I think I was probably hating on the Mavericks for sure, and then that's how we got connected on Twitter. Right. But you know, let's let let's get into it. You like you mentioned, you talked about twenty twenty two for a little bit. I know you don't want to talk about the end result because of course you know Steph, Andrew Wiggins, and them boys they beat you guys. But 2023, 2024 was a different vibe for you guys. Just talk about, you know, how, how was your, how was your emotions? How did you feel from start to finish? How, you know, legit did you think this run would be? How confident were you in this team? Just give me an overall preview of this uh, past season. So first half of the season, honestly, it was, it was a whirlwind. I didn't really know how we were going to do. I was honestly preparing to be a first round exit kind of team just from the season before and not even making the playoffs, having to tank for it. And thankfully we got Derek Lively, which was a godsend. Um, but it, it was hectic. We started off the season eight and two, and then we went to 26 and 23. And that's when, shout out to my guy, Grant, it just, it wasn't the right fit. And the Mavs had realized that they needed better perimeter defense and everything like that. They needed another big that could contribute. So at that time, I wasn't really thinking we were going to make the run that we made. And then we see the trades for P.J. Washington and we see the trades for Daniel Gafford. And then we get rid of Grant and that P.J. trade. Post deadline, first game, we play the Thunder and we beat the Thunder by, I think, 35 and healthy Thunder. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're, we're legit. And then after after that uh, post All Star break, it was just stepping stones and everything like that. So after that All Star break, it was really just a lot of chemistry that started to click. You know, we got to move Derek Lively to the bench, which I thought was huge for his rookie year because he did hit that rookie wall. It's a normal thing. And having Gafford on there, I think PJ was having one of his worst shooting slumps in his career when he got to Dallas, and. Fortunately, it spiked back up at the right time and chemistry started clicking, like I said, and it was a great run. Um, the regular season, I thought we were going to get into that top four and get some home court advantage, but unfortunately we didn't. And entering the playoffs, which, man, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was the most unexpected thing, I'm going to be honest. And I'm a diehard fan, but I'm a realist at the same time. So did you, when you, going into the playoffs, you know, you had – you had the Clippers first round. You probably felt confident about that. Then Kawhi's uh, lingering injuries. You were like, all right, yeah, we should definitely win this game. Of course, after game one, you were like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. you know, I think they beat you guys by like 20 or 30 points. But after that, you guys started to get more comfortable. You realized Kawhi was out. You're like, yeah, we have this one. I think sp specifically moving away from that, going up against OKC, was that the series where you were, the confidence was there or was it low? Like, what, what was your confidence in that one? Man, honestly, going back to the Clippers series, I thought the stepping stone in that was really game three. I was at that game, and that's, oh, when, he, okay. that's when PJ hit the stereo. Yeah, okay, 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 I okay. was like, yep, yep, it's over. And then you go to that OKC series, and I was worried. After game one, I'm like, damn, they, I think they beat us by 20-plus. And I'm just thinking it, it might be Clips, you know. And all of a sudden, Lukai, man. And then PJ Washington, I, I've never, I've never seen something like that from PJ. Yeah, he, he, oh my God, he had his like greatest series ever. He probably would never have that again. Uh, nah, because that was just ridiculous. It so was. You, you went into Minnesota. I'm, I'm pretty sure you were confident in that matchup, especially with the way you guys just matched up with them. The finals happened. Before when you went into the finals, how confident were you? Just, just looking at the overall matchup. 
after the way we exposed Minnesota, I was like, it's our year. Okay. It really was. You know, I, I pre-ordered this. I was I was ready. Oh and my lord. That's why I don't like that's why I don't like Dells as much as y'all other three. <laughs> but um so it, you got the hat. Yeah, wait, there was a hat made. Assume it's, it's, it's WCF hat. hat, but they only put finals on there. It's crazy. Oh, it's crazy. God. So they started selling these right after we won the WCF. And I was like, you know what? If we win the finals, it makes it look like I just got it first, too. So I was in and, you know, it didn't work out that way. But going into that series, I really felt confident. I thought, you know, I think everyone in the country that watched NBA basketball was like the Celtics had a pretty easy path. I'm not going to go too much into that. But with the path that the Mavs had versus what the Celtics had, I thought it was going to be a really good series. I had the Mavs in six, and it just was the complete opposite. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it. Boston definitely didn't have the greatest path. I'm, I'm 100% positive Dallas had a better path, better run to the finals. Um, but, you know, there's better teams in the West. There was a lot of talks about Luka's defense. There was a lot of talks about how it was a bit up and down throughout the playoffs, how sometimes he get energy, sometimes he doesn't. Maybe he's still banged up. What was your thoughts about just, you know, putting the media uh, opinion aside, putting everybody's opinion aside, just your thoughts on his overall defense in the playoffs and then specifically in the finals? So I thought, honestly, in the Western Conference side of the playoffs, I thought he played very solid defense. Um, the analytics can prove that, too. But, you know, he was banged up, man. He was very banged up in the Clipper series. Thunder series, he started to get healthy, and then I think come game five, game six, he got banged up again with Lou Dort, and it was a little unhealthy in the first few games against the Timberwolves, and once you reach the finals, man, I mean, the playoffs are a month and a half, so you're gassed eventually. We all know Luka's not in the best shape, okay, but the man averages 33 points a game, so you can't really hate on that, and speaking of that, Michael Cooper, I don't know if you saw this, Lakers legend. If oh, was, yes, I did. I know what you're if, about to say. If he wasn't a scorer, I would cut him. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't agree. Um, obviously, you shouldn't agree. You know, Luke was probably one of the 10 most talented players we've probably ever seen in our lives. Uh, but, you know, old players just have a, a weird way of thinking about the game. And I ain't going to say it was his way of thinking. I don't agree. But it's just his way of thinking, man. Drew, Drew's got to get his boy, man. That's yeah, his boy. Michael, I, I, I don't know. But, yeah, like, just in the I, – because I, I think when you watch back and you look at the playoffs, in the West specifically, I thought Luka, you know, definitely gave the effort. There was definitely times where he showed he can stop. Uh, he wasn't the weak link. But in the finals, did you think – like, what was your thoughts on his defense in the finals? Because that was really the main thing that people wanted to gravitate to. So, from my understanding and some of the reporting – Obviously, his defense wasn't the best, but part of that and how the fans viewed it, they didn't really understand part of that was their defensive schemes. I get the blow-by percentage was through the roof. Never heard that before, by the way. About the schemes? Never heard of, no, never heard of that stat, blow-by stat, until this finals. Never, ever in my life heard about that stat until these finals. Y'all had Unk talking about it, too, right? He, yeah, he was, he was going crazy on it. I was just like... Low by stats. Okay. Interesting. If you if you go back and watch games though, there was some zone going on. And I think the whole perspective of it was that Luca was gassed and they didn't want him having to play ISO defense. And you look at that Celtics team, man. I mean, everyone was a scorer on that team except Tatum. And you know, it, I think it would have been hard for all of our guys to just ISO guard them. So I think, you know, sort of they wanted to do what the Cel they didn't want to do what the Celtics were doing. The Celtics were just letting Luca and Kyrie go ISO. The Mavs did not want to do that with the Celtics. So they tried zone schemes sometimes, but again, that's not an excuse. I thought Luca's defense was bad in the finals. I'm not gonna sit here and be a biased fan and say it was great, he was hurt, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, I it was a month and a half of the playoffs. Luca needs to get in better shape and the defense needs to get better for sure if he wants to get a ring. And I think he'll improve on it, man. I mean, he's he's 25 years old. What do you think would be the what 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 would be the proper improvements in his defense? Like, what anything specific, or is just you think it's just his motor? I think honestly, for someone that's played basketball for a long time, <laughs> this, this might sound weird. Hip riding, 
-hmm. you know, that that's a, there's a, that's a very crucial thing on defense. And if you go back and watch the games, he does not hip ride his defenders. He sort of likes to, I think you've seen it where he tries to set a charge sort of. Mm -hmm. And when you try that, people are just going to blow by you majority of the time. And that's what he was doing. He tried it on Drew Holiday multiple times as well. And when you're guarding a player at that high of a caliber, you can't really just try to set a fake charge because Luca's known for it. He does it all the time. But yeah, I think hip riding is one thing. And secondly, I think he relies too much on his teammates. You know, I think when you're that top player on a team, you think sometimes you're sort of the man. And I think that got to him a little too much in the finals. Okay. So you, hip riding is definitely a thing. Um, I do think that sometimes when he does a little hip chub thing and he just kind of stands there and then it takes a guy, a defender, just to go around him, that's definitely the, the lazy part of defense. Um, I agree with you. I do think Luca kind of gets a lot of that slack because, like you mentioned, he does do a lot on offense. He He's the primary offensive creator, averaging 30-plus points, north of seven assists. You know, he's the guy. So I guess he expects, well, you guys rely on me offensively so much. Defensively, I expect the same thing, but I, I agree with you. When you're the top guy, prime example, Steph Curry, eventually you have to buy into the defense. The effort has to be there no matter what. So I, I agree with you on that part. So you guys made the finals. Unfortunately, you lost in five games to the Boston Celtics, but you made it. You got that experience, and, you know, Luka got to this point. That's definitely something you need in your career. Walking into this offseason, do you think, you know, you picked up Klay Thompson, you got Najee Marshall, you got Quentin Grimes, which I thought was a steal and a stupid-ass decision by Detroit, but that's the topic for another day. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on just this overall offseason? Man, you can't forget Dinwiddie. You can't forget Dinwiddie. Y'all got, got Dinwiddie? You got Dinwiddie. And when did you guys get him? It was after all those signings. I didn't even realize y'all got Dinwiddie. So, boom, yeah. talk about it. Yeah, so Clay, I mean, obviously, we'll start off with Clay. That I think that's just a phenomenal signing. We got him for cheap. You know, he had an offers from the Lakers for more money and more years. So it's sort of shocking that way, you know, especially because his dad's connected with the Lakers very well. So the Clay edition, I'm very excited for. There are a few things that I am worried about, and you could sort of elaborate on this as well, being a Warriors fan. It's going to be interesting to see how he adjusts to different offense. You know, he's very used to having Draymond set the pin downs, the flares, running off ball all the time. And that's not really how the Mavs system is made. So that's going to be very interesting to see because you're going to have guys like P.J. Washington setting pin downs and flares now. Obviously, Clay, you can say you can argue it. I think he's a solid shot creator still. And with having that, I mean, man, I don't think you can really double us anymore. You know, Clay's a 40% career three-point shooter. So when Luca has the ball, if he's getting doubled and you have Clay in the corner, it's just typically he's going to be cash. Um, so I love the addition of that. How do you think – I because I'm really curious to hear from Warriors fans' perspective, how do you think Clay's going to adjust to that Mavs offense? I Honestly, I think he's going to be amazing. Like I, I had a, I did a tier list, and I had you guys as like a, a tier one group because I think Clay Thompson – Listen, he was bad last year. There's no no slicing that he was bad last year. But at the same time, we had him as a number two. I don't believe he is a number two anymore. That's just not in his game. I and I believe that. at this point, like you mentioned, the way we run our system, it's very motor reliant with those two guys, very, you know, stamina reliant with him, with Dallas. He'll see a lot more catch and shoot opportunities, a lot more standstill opportunities. And I think as a shooter, you know, having those legs to just stand there and be more prepared instead of, running around on game. I think that a lot of that was, you know, a, a credit to him being gassed in the games and him being a little tired. Of course, you know, he's dealing he, – he's coming off, what, two or three leg injuries? Yep. So that also takes that away from you. I think he's going to be great in Dallas. I think the fact that he can still guard three to fives, you know, the fact that, like you mentioned, he's still a near 40% three-point shooter. And Klay Thompson would never, ever get left open, no matter what year it is anyways. The respect would always be there. So I think – for you guys, like you mentioned, with the proper lineups, you won't see a single double team. And if you do, it's do or die with those uh, with those three point shooters. I agree. Yeah, I'm I'm very excited about the clay edition. And then you bring in someone like Najee, who I personally think is a complete upgrade from Derek Jones Jr. You know, offensively and strength wise too. I mean, DJJ, you know, the length was there. Pause. 
But you know, <laughs> um, but Najee's I think Najee's like six seven two twenty. Yeah, he's a lot bigger too. Yeah, he's a lot bigger, and Najee just came off his best shooting year. He shot thirty eight point seven percent from three, and they call him, they don't call him the Swiss Army knife. They call him the knife. <laughs> like that's got to mean something, bro. So I'm really excited about Najee. I think Luca throughout his whole career, he sort of had that guy that always defends him and makes sure like no one's messing around with him. He had Dorian Finney-Smith, he had Derek Jones Jr., and now he has Najee. So I think he's going to sort of take in that role that DJJ had. And then obviously, like you said, Quentin is just huge, man. I mean, before he got traded, I think he was a 37 plus percent three-point shooter with the Knicks. You know, he was starting for the Knicks some games. He's an insanely good defender. So Man, shout out to Nico Harrison. I personally think he's one of the best GMs in the NBA. He did a phenomenal job this offseason getting Dinwiddie as well. So all of those additions I'm really excited about. No, yeah, from the moment he picked up Grant Williams and then traded him since now, he's done an amazing job. Like, he's been on go. He's realizing what he has. And you mentioned it. Quentin Grimes was dealing with a lot of injuries with Detroit and towards the back end of New York. So I understand the the maybe the doubt, but you still he's still really young. He still is a really good defender. And like you mentioned, it, you guys need shooting. You guys need shooting. Like the problem with Derrick Jones Jr. and PJ Washington, they weren't offering a shit ton of shooting in the finals. You know, with Clay, with Najee, with Quentin Grimes, you don't lose a lot defensively, and you gain a massive upgrade in three point shooting. And I think that's the big key for you guys. You know, Luca and Kyrie, they're gonna do what they do. Kyrie. He's getting up there in age, but his game isn't relied heavily on, you know, uh, athleticism. He's very skilled, craftiness and stuff like that. Yep. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see Dallas. Now, you've talked about the additions. You know, you've got Najee. You've got Quinn Grimes. You still had Jaden Hardy on the, uh, on the roster. You still have Maxi Cleaver, who was dealing with injuries last year. He's coming back. Derek Lively is the, the nucleus of all this. He's kind of the guy that, you know, you got in the draft last year. You saw him play last year. He was an insane upgrade for you guys at the center position. You've seen a lot of Mavericks fans give that Tyson Chandler comp with the way he impacted your team and helped you guys win that 2011 championship. What are your takes on – because I remember we had a conversation on the pod prior to when I – I missed an episode, and apparently Joel said Derek Lively can be Bam out of body on defense. I was told the next episode – I don't know if it's that far, but – what are your thoughts just on Derek Lively's development? What do you think he needs to improve on? What's his ceiling? What's his impact level on this team? Just speaking on Derek Lively as a whole. Hey, first of all, Mavs Nation needs to shout out Joel. <laughs> that man, that man is a supporter. Yes, he I love is. it. Yeah, I love it, man. I love it. Um, and I love how he dislikes Tatum so much. <laughs> but you know, D Live, I mean, when you when you talk about him, I don't, I mean, the thing is just like I get sort of what he's talking about, the BAM situation, but it's two completely different players. Um, BAM's a, a four who's, you know, proven he's a three-point shooter as well now. So speaking of D-Live, you know, I've heard reports as well from a few insiders that he is probably going to be the guaranteed sort starter for the Mavs, which is a big thing for us because I think what we saw in the playoffs was that Gafford was not performing well in the first half a lot throughout the playoffs. And Derek Lively, similar to the 2022 run, where Dwight Powell would start for four minutes and then Maxi Kleber would get subbed in immediately. We were sourcing the same thing with Gafford and Lively in this year's playoffs. So I think making that adjust adjustment to him as a starter is going to be really big. But just the growth he had throughout his rookie year was insane, I thought. Um, one thing that really stood out to me that people didn't talk enough about was his short roll game. I thought he was one of the best short roll facilitators in the NBA which is huge for us this year because when you bring in a guy like Clay and you're running that short roll game with Luca and he's the one that's reading that three on two situation when he's in the middle of the paint free throw line area and he has two guys in the corner and it's the one on one downhill. I think that's huge for us. So I'm really excited for Derek Lively sophomore year and it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, Derek, Derek Lively, he's athletic rim running five, you know, can run with the best of them pre athletic. What people don't, what people didn't realize from last year, of course, watching the Warriors, Clay Thompson and Trace Jackson had an insane connection in that pick and roll game. Like it was really 
really amazing that they just clicked so fast. And you can, like you mentioned, you can see that with him and Derek Lively in the short role. Um, with Derek Lively, do you see a insane upgrade in his offensive game? Yes, a, th- a thousand percent. I think I think one thing that stood out, and you mentioned it, he works out with Tyson Chandler constantly. And Tyson Chandler was unreal for the Mavs. He was unreal for the Knicks. So I think training with him is huge. And I think, honestly, if you watch the film on Twitter and you see it all over social media, he pulls out the Euros. He's got the spin. He's been working on the hook. And one thing we saw in the finals was he can start shooting the three a little now. I know it was only one shot, but if you go watch the high school film, the guy was a shooter in high school. And that's one thing he was working on in the offseason as well this year is the shooting. So I think we see actually a pretty big upgrade. Statistically, though, I don't know how much his numbers are going to rise because I think he's going to see similar minutes because there's no reason to play him 35 minutes a game when you have someone like Daniel Gafford as well. Yeah, he he's probably going to hover around the 2025 20, range. Yeah. Uh, the three point shot is a big thing. If he can start hitting that corner three point shot, then you know, or, or even hit you know mid range post ups, hit, hit hit something like that, he can start to become a legit threat. Because if you look at guys similar to his size, you know, Shet is another one. Victor Wembayana is another one. These guys are very versatile offensive players that can hit the three ball, can space out. So there, and that's kind of gearing towards the game seven one seven two lengthy guys. Even Porzingis about his similar base. So if Lively can do that, then that's that's impressive. You know, it's huge. It's huge. And I think I think one people some people are talking about this having Lively and Gafford in lineups if Lively Please. starts shooting. I don't like it. I don't I like it. I'll, I'll say I'll say this. Look at the Cavs when they have Mobley and Allen on the floor. I'm not a fan of it whatsoever. I, I'm not. I'd rather have a lively Kleber lineup where Kleber's, you know, 6'10", he's the four, and you have lively who can shoot. But the, the thing is, is like you look at the Thunderman, they could be running lineups with Chet and Hardenstein too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes you might need that size. And, and I, I've seen you on Twitter having a conversation with somebody about Maxi Kleber. Is, 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 is it up for him? Is, is he hanging it up, man? Is, does he still got anything left? I know Dallas, they love him. They love what he brings to the court. They love what he brings as a player, but he's getting up there in age. He was dealing with a ton of injuries, and then when you guys brought him back, he really just wasn't good. No, nah, Maxie's my guy for sure, off the court as well. That's my guy, but um, I, I keep it a buck, man. I, I just think he's sort of aging. You know, I've never been a fan of his shot. It, it really hurts my eyes to see his form <laughs> sometimes. But, you know, the perimeter defense isn't there as well. And that was something that we really relied on before this year was his perimeter defense. And I thought he just didn't really do anything this year for us. That was really huge. I think he had he had one good game against the Clippers, but I think he's peaking in age. And I don't think we see a lot of Maxi. We do have Olivier Maxens Prosper, who's going to be a second year for us next year. And I think he might step into his role a little bit. I think he's going to play in the G League too a little bit as well. So. I don't expect us to see as much as Maxi as people think. But the thing is, is that people are thinking Najee Marshall is going to be Clay's backup. And they're thinking Maxi's going to be PJ's backup at the four. The way I have the rotation set up, for me personally, I would have Najee playing the four as PJ's backup. You might as well look, just say the whole rotation, man. Start point guard, shooting guard, small forward. Let's come on. So my my rotation. Yeah, listen, this is you. I'm asking you, MFL Nation, I'm asking you, what's your rotation for the Dallas Mavericks, man? So my rotation would be Luca, Kyrie, Clay, PJ, and Lively as a starting lineup. Your backup point guard, I would go Dinwiddie for sure. I think most experience, he had success with the Mavs in that 2022 run, whooped the Suns in the uh, semifinals as well. The two, the backup gets confusing because you have more of a veteran caliber player in Exum, but you also want to get Hardy those reps as well. So I think they're going to go back and forth between that. And then my backup three is Quentin Grimes. My backup four is Najee. And my backup center, obviously, is Daniel Gafford. And I think that's a phenomenal rotation. That's a nice. I like that. That is nice. I think you have to eventually give in to Hardy, though. I think because you have to see what he is. You know what I'm saying? You have to figure out what's his go-to, what's his vibe. Dante Exum is a cool vet, though. I love Quentin Grimes at the three. That's a nice, that's a nice ten-man rotation. Mm. 
Hardy, the thing with the the thing with Hardy is, is the inconsistency, man. You know, we saw we saw him do well against the Wolves. He was yeah. he was talking smack to Ant. I was like, oh no, don't. No, I, listen, Hardy confidence is through the roof. You through know, the roof. and I know I know you remember high school Hardy. Oh. Who doesn't? Well, a lot of people don't. But Jaden Hardy was different in high school. Different. So different. when do you when do you decide on getting minutes to Omax? Like where where is that going to play into effect? So I think the thing for Omax is that we've tried to give him flash flashes of minutes here and there when guys are out last season. And honestly, I think right now he hasn't adjusted from college crowd to NBA crowd, which is a lot of people think. NBA players, they just can handle all of that kind of stuff. They can't. They're normal people at the end of the day. Some can handle it better. But I think, you know, we saw Omax in the playoffs get some minutes at the end of games versus Celtics, the Timberwolves, the Thunder. Uh, actually, not the Thunder. He was out versus Thunder. But I think you're going to have to see more development in his three-point shot. And as far as defense, he's very defensively. I think he's defensively already better than Maxi. So I think really just having him – be able to knock down corner threes is going to be what gets him on the court more often. Okay. So you've, you've had, I want to say you've had one of the best off seasons in the NBA. You brought in clay, you brought in Quinn Grimes, Najee Marshall, you got brought in Spencer Dinwiddie. You know, you still have that Luca Kyrie duo. Luca's going to get healthy this off season. Jason Kidd is pretty locked in lively's development. What's your expectations for this upcoming season? Where do you think you guys finish in the regular season? How far can you get? Like, just walk me through the West, because the West right now, you've got Denver. They're going to rely a lot on their youth on the bench. Minnesota hasn't really made too many adjustments. You know, they they, they picked up Rob Dillingham. Uh, then you got OKC. OKC was another team that had a big, big offseason. You know, so these are the three teams you're kind of gunning with. What's your expectations for this upcoming season? So as far as teams I'm worried with honestly I'm man I I'll circle back to that but <laughs> yeah yeah so, if, you're, if you're not worried about anybody you could just say that you know be you I'm not worried bro <laughs> uh, when playoff come playoff time come playoff mm -hmm. time hey I know I know jaw was capping but fine in the west <laughs> um but I do I think I think we finish a top four um, you know, we do see Luca and Kyrie get some rest in the regular season pretty often. And there's going to be times where they may, you know, we know Luca, bro, knock on wood, but there's injuries that occur, calm, light injuries that you're going to have to miss some games. And I think lock for the number one seed, I think, is the Thunder. I think with the additions that they made and the consistency that they have in the regular season, having a young, healthy team is really beneficial for them. So I put the Thunder at one for sure. And then I think from there, Man, people are sleeping on Memphis, bro. Mm. In Sleep the regular on. season, for sure. In the regular season, yes. Regular season, yeah, yeah, yeah. They haven't, they haven't proved anything in the playoffs yet. But I think you have to look at, for that two through four battle, you know, I think there's Memphis, Dallas, and Minnesota. I think we sort of see a downfall in Denver. You know, people are really underrating Ooh. losing Casey. Hey, I, I, I'm a big KCP guy, and uh -huh. I think the fact that they lost him is crucial. And – now you're now you're having to rely on he's a good player, but now you're having to rely on Christian Braun to sort of overtake what he did. And I just I don't think he's there yet. I don't think he's ready yet. So top four for sure. I'm gonna go three or four seed for regular season. And I think expectation wise, I think it's to get this hat back and say we we're actually champions. So yeah, man, it's gonna it's gonna be tricky. I think the hardest matchup is gonna be OKC in the playoffs. I think the additions that they made this offseason, and shout out to my boy Dylan Jones. He got drafted to the Thunder. That's my guy. Um, but you know, having Caruso there and Hardenstein, I think that's huge. I was a big Hardenstein guy. I actually got trolled on Twitter. My yeah. most my most viewed post on Twitter. I, I was a rookie on Twitter and I made. I had some dude make an edit of Luca and Hardenstein. It was just a picture. I got trolled. I got trolled terribly. Seven point seven million views. Everyone, was, who, who is Hardenstein? And he showed out. He did. No, he thirty million dollar man. Hey, hey. So I think I think OKC will be the hardest competition for sure, and I think we will see them again in the playoffs. But 
I think you just look at the veteran side of things. You know, you have Luca, Kyrie, Clay. I, I just think that three right there is better than OKC's three. Hmm, okay, okay. I, you know what? That's not that's not terrible to say. What do you I, think? What do you think, man? Well, I think Kyrie is still better than J Dub until we see the the upgrade and development. Clay and Chat, I might go chat. I'm not even gonna sit here and lie to you. I, Clay and Chat, I might go chat just because of what he can bring defensively as a rim protector. His offense is pretty scalable. Uh, and then, of course, Luca is the best out the bunch. But SGA is an MVP candidate, so you know I'm not gonna not gonna disregard that. But Luca, Kyrie, Clay, I'll probably go them for sure. So right you're, now, you're, t- you're telling me Lively Dan I'll play Chet in the playoffs. I would say I think he did, but at the same time, they have different responsibilities. He was dunking on him, man. I think I think Lively, Lively did outplay Chet, but Chet. Ah, Chet just he just wasn't hitting the jumper. That was really what's what was killing him. It wasn't he wasn't hitting the jumper at a consistent rate. And then they have him man in the paint by himself. I never thought that was the best idea, especially in the playoffs, you know, going against Gafford and Lively. But that's I why think, I think they're so scary. That's why I think they're so scary, too, is because they're not gonna have to rely on Chet as much on defense anymore. And I think that's gonna make him better on offense shooting wise. He's not gonna be as banged up playing the five twenty four seven. No, yeah, and then like, like that's the matchup for me right here. Like OKC, Dallas. I do think Dallas and Denver is an interesting conversation because it's two different styles, and I think the Joker could really exploit that matchup. But the problem with me is Denver on the perimeter. You know, like would they be able to keep up with Luca and Kai while also maintaining the level of efficiency on the offensive end? You know, that would be the problem. But OKC and Dallas is the matchup right now. Like they're. They got Caruso, they got Hardenstein, the development of their big three. You guys picked up Clay, QG, Najee, and you still got the, the dynamic duo of Luka and Kai. Like, it's really Dallas and OKC with a sprinkle of Denver, and then Minnesota's kind of just like, hey, we're here, like, having a little fun ball. Because Minnesota, you can't sleep on them, but at the same time, offensively, it's just, they're rough. They're rough around the edges. Ah. They gotta make they gotta make some moves, man. If if you were the T Wolves GM, who would you rather trade right now, Rudy or Cat? Damn, damn, that's tough. I know, I know. I I, I was thinking about it too, man, because they got to get rid of one of them. Here's the thing: Cat gets fifty fat million dollars, man. I don't know who's taking that Cat contract. Rudy's one of the best defenders in the world. But then cat at the five is just not ideal. I don't – I'll probably have to go cat. I'll probably have to. You still I have agree. Nas Reed. Off That's why I'm saying I'm a diehard Nas. Hey, I know, New Jersey, man. Asbury yeah. Park. Uh, big, no. big, big Jersey. Yeah, you still got Nas Reed. My whole thing with them is Jaden McDaniels. Like, is he going to ever upgrade into that offensive player or he's just going to be this defensive menace? But in certain defensive matchups, he can't stick with certain players. He gets fouled out. He's not a good passer. Ball handling needs work. The three-point shooting is streaky. So for him, it's like with Cat, Cat is tough to move Cat because offensively he's gifted and Rudy's not. But defensively, Rudy's one of them ones. So they're in a tough situation, honestly. They need to play that. My biggest thing for them, I think they need to play Nikhil Alexander Walker more. I think he's unreal. I he's a dog he's defensively. A dog. He's a dog. Oh, you, know he's, that, you know that yeah. shit cousin, right? Cool. I've been a Shade fan since Kentucky, man. My fault. Yeah, of course I know that Shade cousin. But I, I don't know who they sit. Do they sit Conley? He's a 40% three-point shooter. You got to yeah, keep something um, out there. I was pissed. 2K came out with the three-point ratings. They had Conley top five. That was crazy. I'm not going to lie. I mean, 2K rate. Who would be top five? Who's you one up there? Steph. Well, Steph was one. Steph. Clay. Was Clay up there? He should be. I hope he is. I hope they don't do him that dirty. Let me, let me pull that up real quick. Was Dame up there? I don't even. I remember. Well, they didn't have Dame. They didn't yeah, have they, Dame. They, that that that's who they were missing. I think. Okay. So okay. Yeah, because I, I had Steph. Steph on, one. Man. We can we can name twenty three point shooters better than Mike Conley. Twenty. Ugh. Ten probably. Twenty. I think you're doing too much. My Ten point. year. Ten year. Who will top five top five three point shoes in the league right now? You got Steph. Yep. You got I'm, I'm still playing Clint. Yeah. Grayson Allen. For sure. Oh my God, he went stupid. Yeah, I'm taking and I'm taking bro. I'm taking Luke Kennard over Mike Conley shooting wise. Luke Kennard over. 
Does he have the volume? Volume, that's a fair point. Volume matters. Uh, I'm trying to think. I got I got this right here. Ooh. Would you take Donovan Mitchell over Conley for three point shooting? They're two different shooters. Mm-hmm. I, of course, Mitchell's probably at a lower percentage. He takes tougher shots. I mean, Kyrie shot 41% from three. Kyrie's just an unreal. I'll put Kyrie over Conley. I would too. Kyrie's just an unreal efficient player. Shot You're not going to want to. You know who shot 41.5% from three? Who? D'Lo. D'Lo was amazing this year from the three point line. He was. He was amazing. Luke the Kennard team. shot 45%, but he wasn't getting up a lot of attempts. So uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. It's it's interesting. I mean, Sam Hauser. I'm taking you know, Piper. Sam Hauser for sure. Um, I, you're right. Ten probably, but not twenty. No. Yeah, because like in a booth, I, Sam Hauser probably shoots better than ninety five percent of dudes. Like you know, just in a booth, like sure. who's he better shooter? But like that, it's about volume. Do these guys get the same amount of volume? Like Conley gets up a good amount of shots. So that's that's tough. So who's you so, back? Who's your backup point? Is it going to be Rob? It's going to be Rob. Rob is going to get a good amount of minutes. That's why it's like I don't know. Minnesota's in. They're not. They're not in a weird position, but they're in a weird position. I hope. I, I do hope Ant gets a solid roster built around him soon. Because I think. I think you know. I personally, coming from me, like this. I think this is like finally this year is the first time Lucas had like a stable roster. So I hope Ant for Ant say I'm an Ant fan. So I hope for Ant's sake he gets like a stable roster sooner than later because that cat Rudy stuff is not going to work. Yeah, eventually, because Rudy's getting up there in age, um, Conley's probably going to retire after next year, so he's he's pretty up there in age. So it, it, that roster definitely, I, I hope so too. I do think because I do think he wants to be there. You know, I think he wants to build something in Minnesota, but you got to you got to find a way to keep him there. Same thing with Luca in Dallas. You know, he's big on. You know, building him and Dirk have a great relationship. So yeah. I definitely think he wants to stay there too. It's just about building that ecosystem to where you can stay. A thousand percent, man. A thousand. So you so in in a this is my last question. In in a potential matchup against Boston, like say for example, you run it back. How do these additions improve that matchup? Well, I think firstly, I mean, everyone saw it immediately. The shooting was horrific against Boston. You couldn't make a shot. Um Another thing is, is that I don't – people can say what they want. I think if we do rematch Boston, I don't think Kyrie has that performance he had this past year. And then I think just being able to stretch the floor out better this year is going to be crucial. I think we have the defense to guard Boston. I think that was a struggle because you look at the teams that we were playing in the Western Conference, they had their two or three guys that were their go-to bucket getters. And when we played Boston, it was like, Man, everyone's getting buckets. Drew was torching us. D. White was getting his. Brown, Tatum, you know, when Porzingis, I mean, Porzingis, when he was healthy, that that was crazy, man. Yeah, he came in. He was on – everything was up. And I think – I think it's not all about players. I thought Jason Kidd did a poor coaching job in the finals. Um, you know, he was switching a lot of screens, and you saw when Porzingis was in the game, there was a lot of times – we would switch, and you have Jaden Hardy on Kristaps Porzingis. That's just not going to work out for someone who's 7'3", amazing shooter, and you're already in your spot immediately in that role. So I think defensively I we're more stable. You bring in a guy like Najee who can probably switch on to guys like Porzingis now with the weight he brings compared to Derek Jones Jr. I think Quentin Grimes is someone that you can trust to guard Jalen Brown. Okay, yeah. No, Quentin Grimes is a little smaller, but definitely – a strong defender. My thing is, though, is like everyone's saying is Celtics is a lock. I don't think they're a lock. To come out the East? They're not a lock to come out the East. Um, They're definitely the most locked in the league to come yeah, out. They're, they're, yeah, they're they're the leader for sure, but I don't, I mean, I don't who, think. Who can beat them? Milwaukee? Maybe. Not Milwaukee. I think, you know, I'm not even going to. If Philly stays healthy. If they Maybe, play. yeah, Philly. Philly. I like the Knicks though. I think the, the the Knicks are my favorite. I like the Knicks too. The Knicks. The main problem for me is they don't have a number. Well, they don't have a proven number two guy, and I think in a, in a matchup against Boston that can be very vital. 
you know, you, you've seen stretches where you have Jalen Brown, you have Jason Tatum. Sometimes you have Drew Holiday, you have Porzingis. It again, you don't think, you don't think Julius Randle can be that number two? That, that's why I said proven because I think he has all the ability in the world. But Kenny, I don't know. Like Mikael Bridges is not. OG is not. I know that for a fact. So it has to be Randall. If he can do that defensively, I think they're pretty much ready to guard Boston. It's right. just offensively, can they keep up? That's that's really the tricky part for me. I I agree with you there. I think I think I think Celtics definitely have the highest chance of again. They're not even just winning the Eastern Conference Finals, winning the NBA Finals. I think you know that team that they have um, is special. But I think, man, I hope everyone in the East stays healthy. Because I think one thing that really benefited Boston is that what was the highest played ser- game played series in five games? East? Yeah, they didn't, play, they didn't play many games in the East. Yeah, so I think I think with the way the East is built now, I think you know I saw you uh, had the guy on from the Magic a few nights ago as well. I think the Magic are really good. So I think even teams like that that could potentially take them to a six game series is going to wear them down a little bit more for the finals and make it a more I'm not going to say even, but make it a better matchup for whoever they play in the finals. I agree. I, I, I want to thank you for coming up here. I want to thank you for giving me the time of day you had to go to your dorm or your school to, to give me some time. I appreciate that. Drop all your info so everybody can find you, man. Man, Instagram and Twitter, Twitter mostly, is at Nation MFFL. And then YouTube, we're going to get the pod started back up as well for the upcoming season. Hopefully, we can get the pick a side guys on there eventually, too. So y'all tune into those pages. I really appreciate you having me on as well, Riv. It was a it was a fun time for sure. Yeah, I want to I want to thank you for coming up here. Didn't even know you had a podcast. You didn't tell anybody. You kind of just brought that in at the end. It, it, was, it was it was quiet during the off season, man. Uh, OK, so you guys are like a regular season type thing. It's me only right now and we're it was inconsistent 2023 24 season and we're we're getting it set you know we saw we saw the good upgrade on twitter that we've been having so trying to take that more serious on the youtube side as well and get it consistent to where i'm popping content out on youtube after each game and then doing some podcasts for non-game days as well so stay tuned for that for sure and yeah i love that I want to thank you for being up here. Once again, follow my boy on Twitter. Shout out to Fantasy Reaction Show. Shout out to Rip Academy, the Joel Moran Show. And, of course, the Big Bad Wolf. Shout out to Pick a Side. I want to thank you all for being here. And y'all have a good night. Yes, sir.